So the Gospel of Mark, Jesus declares at the very beginning of it, the kingdom of God is here, it's now, it's arrived. And Jesus begins to demonstrate that rule, that authority, that power that God has brought into the world through his only son. We, we pick up our text here in chapter 4, verse 21, where we left off last week. It, it's a parable, there's several of them, but he starts off with that first verse, and he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed, is it not to be set on a lampstand? Now, I've got a picture of an ancient Jewish lamp. I want to bring it up on the screen. That's what they look like. You can actually buy one of those if you go to Israel. And they would take it and light it and sit it on a lampstand, usually a one-room house in the middle of the room or on a shelf where it was center and could give some light to the room. Obviously, today, we just flip a switch. Uh, it wasn't so in ancient Israel. A light was a very precious commodity, and they needed this lamp at night. It would, it would kind of stave off intruders. It would give light to see. And God is now clearly, and Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God all during this first part of the Gospel of Mark, God has now clearly revealed the mystery of redemption, that the kingdom of God has come through his son. And it's appeared through his teaching. It's happening through his healing of people, his calling of his disciples, his even uh, boldness to say sins are forgiven through him. He, Jesus Christ, the light has come into the world. And the kingdom of God is now, is what he's saying. We saw last week, through the parable of the soils, that, that not all embrace it. There's stony ground, our stony hearts, there's thorny ground, there's shallow, there's cares of the world. And Jesus is talking about that the truth through him has now come, and it's, it's, it's to be revealed, and it's to, well, to, to light up the darkness. He's the center of all truth and the center of all faith. And so he's sharing this, this parable. Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? And as believers, we're called to, to walk in that light, to walk in that truth, to, to live in that kingdom, so to speak, that's come. John, the disciple of Jesus, put it this way in 1 John chapter 1. He, he probably remembered Jesus talking about the light. He says, this is the message we, which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, well, then we lie and do not practice the truth. In other words, if we say, hey, yeah, I, I, I love Jesus, I walk in the light with him, but truly we practice those things that are not of the Lord, then he says we're just liars and we're actually walking in darkness. We all know what it's like probably to walk through a dark room, get up during the middle of the night or you hear something and it's dark or you're in a strange room, a hotel or something, and, and you've got to make your way through a dark room. It, it, it's awkward. You can stumble. It, it's kind of uh, scary maybe. It's slow. And, and Christ has come to, to give truth and light so that we can walk. We can walk with certainty. We, we can walk with clarity. We can walk with purpose and assurance. Uh, we, we live in a dark culture. I think you're aware of that. We, li we live in a time that seems to be getting darker every day. And the true light is, is, is there. It's, it, it lights up our path, so to speak. And people choose all kinds of different lights to walk by. There's the light of reason, our intellect, our science, our feelings, this is how I feel about something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow the way I feel regardless of the truth. There, there's, there's the 
the, the light of intuition or even psychics or, or drugs or mind expansion. But they're all very shadowy, unclear, dim, if you will, lights compared to the truth of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The brightness and the clarity and the brilliance of the truth of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is amazing. And we live in a culture right now where it's hard to know what to trust. What light is real? Now, I was at a soccer game yesterday for one of my grandkids, and I, and I had these weird heart palpitations. And so I was feeling kind of weird, and, and uh, I was, I was, Lynn was looking at me, and, the, and there was a, a young guy standing nearby who had said he was a doctor. So I said, you're a doctor? He goes, yeah. I said, well, and he had a little, for some reason, he had a medical bag with him. I don't know if he works for the, you know, the association there, but he, he said, uh, I can listen to your heart. So he opens his little thing. He's a doctor, and, you know, doctors seem to be getting younger and younger to me. <laughs> So, so he, he, he takes out the testoscope, and I'm thinking, I, this kid's way too young to be a doctor. And he listens to my heartbeat, and when he takes off the things, he, he goes like this. I go, what's wrong? He goes, no heartbeat. Well, I got a picture of him. My son took a picture of him. There, there he is right there. This kid was classic. I didn't really have a heart palpitation, but I told him I did. And he had his little yellow bag, and he, he, apparently he goes to the school here, and he, and he very seriously goes, I'm a doctor. <laughs> my wife asked him where his office was, and he said, it's in my home somewhere. I said, okay. <laughs> but anyway, I have no heartbeat. And I didn't trust him either, I'll tell you that. There's all kinds of lights in the world that, that, that are constantly tweaked and changed according to the desires and the understanding of the world and the culture we live in. All kind of different feelings about the truth. And, and yet, we, we, we have a light and we have truth in God's Word and in His Son, Jesus Christ. And there's certain things that are becoming foggier and foggier in our, and dimmer and dimmer to apprehend the truth in our culture today. Certainly sexuality is one of them. This whole crazy, insane debate about gender. Amen. Now you're trying to, you know, people are trying to figure out how to determine gender. Is that insane? Yes. Talk about a light going dim. I, I mean, and then there's all kinds of justification. There used to be a time in the in the in the in the Christian mindset in the in the culture of the church that it was that it was known to be wrong for a couple to live together outside of marriage. Today, that light's grown very dim. Oh, well, it's no big deal. God understands. Same-sex marriage. In our culture today, it used to be a huge taboo. Not so much today, is it? Not so much. We, we've even created, because of the light of reason and feelings and desire, as a culture shifts and change according to feelings and intuition and intellect and science, we, we create new words. When I was growing up, th there wasn't a word called, or even an acronym called LGBT. Well, today everybody knows it. Didn't exist back then. Stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer. And then they've added QIA to it as well, which is queer, gender fluid. There's intersex, which means anatomy issues. There's, there's asexual, that means there's no sexual attraction. And this, this whole culture that we're living in that's shifting and changing and, and the light is growing dimmer and dimmer, it goes beyond the truth and laws of Scripture. But truth, it seems, 
in our culture today is constantly changing based on reason, based on science, based on desires. I mean, I, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. I remember when marijuana was illegal. Now in all kinds of states, you can buy it and smoke it and puff it and huff it. That's okay. I'm not talking about medicinal marijuana, although that's, well, I'm not gonna say anything because some of you got glassy eyes out there, so. <laughs> Just kidding. God's light, God's Son, His truth, it doesn't change. Amen. Right? It doesn't change. It, it, it stays the same. Many people don't want to see the light or acknowledge the light or, or, or be under the truth. John chapter 3 says, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And Jesus says, you don't, you don't know how I'm supposed to hide it. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practice evil, hates the light, does not come to the light. And if I could, could make that word light say Jesus or truth, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they've been done in God. Blindness. Blindness to the light is walking in darkness. The, the Pharisees and, and scribes who were opposed to Jesus were blind to him. He clearly demonstrated who he was. From the very beginning, he would cast out demons. I say, oh, he, he does it by the power of Satan. He heals the sick. Oh, he did it on the Sabbath. He broke the law. He forgives sins. Who does he think he is? He would put love and mercy before law and ritual. And so they closed their eyes to the light. See, pride will blind you. They were so proud of who they were and the status they had that they were unwilling to recognize that the true light, the true authority, that the kingdom had come in Jesus Christ. So they closed their eyes to the light. A lot of people do that out of pride. Popularity will do that. I'm so concerned about what others think of me, uh, how they might view me if, if I walked in the light or embraced this light. Disobedience will blind you. Pursuing pleasure and, 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 and knowing that it's wrong, but I, I've got to have it in my life. And it'll rob you of peace, the love of money and pleasure blinds people. The story of the rich young ruler, oh, I've done all that. Oh, Jesus, oh, you've done all that. Yes, I've done all, kept all the law. Well, well, then just go sell all your possessions and come follow me. And he went away sorrowful because his true God was, well, it was money. He was blinded by it. We have a culture that's more concerned, listen, about tolerance and freedom and pleasure and personal rights than it is truth. And it's blinded our culture. We can be, well, maybe you've heard this illustration. The captain of a ship looked into the dark night and saw a faint light in the distance. And he told his signalmen to send a message, alter your course 10 degrees south. Promptly a message was received, alter your course 10 degrees to the south or to the north. The captain was angry. His command had been ignored, so he sent a second message. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a captain. Message was received, and another came back. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I'm a seaman, third class. Immediately, the captain sent a third message, knowing the fear it would evoke. He said, alter your course 10 degrees south. I'm a battleship. The reply came after 
that and said, alter your course 10 degrees north. I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> and in the midst of a dark culture, it's like people don't want to recognize the lordship or the reality, just like the Pharisees and the scribes, that the kingdom of God has come now in Jesus Christ. And he's the one that says to you and I in the midst of darkness, hey, alter your course. Get in the light. Walk in it. And receive the blessings that come from it. God has made it very clear who he is and the life that he has called us to. Listen to chapter 4 of Mark. There it says in verse 21, is a lamp, has this kingdom come through Jesus Christ to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on the lampstand so you can see clearly how to walk? He mentions a bushel here. And that was used for, you know, used to put in grain or, or, or to carry bread or it was a, a common thing you would see in a home. It, it really probably has to do a picture, if you will, or a symbol of, of a job or work and career. And so you could perhaps draw the analogy that Jesus is saying, look, you're not to hide or allow your work, your career, your concern about money or status to overcome the light of Jesus Christ in your life or to draw you away from him. He, he mentions a bed. It, it could speak of domestic responsibilities. Those, those who get so consumed with life and family and those type of things that, that the truth of Jesus Christ and the following of him becomes a very low priority in life and he's no longer, so to speak, the center of your life. After job or after family, he comes somewhere way down on the list. And so he says, is, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? You know, uh, an ancient lamp, I, I, I think I have a picture. Did I show this picture already of an ancient lamp? I did? Well, there it is again. <laughs> and that would shine up and fill the whole room. Jesus says in verse 22, For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. Now, now let me have your attention. He, he says the veil or the mystery over who God's son is, the one who's the way, the truth, and the life has been lifted. The kingdom of God is at hand. He's the final and full revelation of God's love and of God's truth. And Jesus is making that statement. The opposition is beginning to grow stronger and his truth and his light exposes what is false, what is dark, and what is evil. You, you either believe in Christ and his word, or you make up your own truth. That, that's kind of the scenario. Some of it has to do, look what it goes on to say in verse 23. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. It's kind of that principle, what you do not use, you lose. That's the thing. Now, now most things wear out. If you've lived any amount of time, you know that your car wears out. You ever having car problems? Your tools wear out. Your appliances wear out. Your roof eventually wears out. Your body wears out. The scripture even says the outer man is perishing, but, but the inner man will grow stronger day by day. But, but God's word, his truth, it doesn't deteriorate. This is kind of where I'm headed. Listen, listen to this. This is what this is saying. 
with the use of truth in your life. It's one of the things that never grows old. It doesn't wear out. It's like Bible study. No one can prayerfully and systematically study the Word of God without entering into an expanding, growing world of light and truth. As you study it, it begins to unveil itself deeper and deeper. It's an amazing thing. Most things that you apply pressure to or, you know, you, you work on, they, they wear out. But in Scripture, one insight leads to another. One small phrase expands into a larger truth. A thought connects to another thought, and understanding and knowledge and light gets larger and brighter, more real, more precious. It's kind of like, wow, the, your word is a lamp unto my feet, but also as I study it, it becomes a light unto my path. And it just continues to expand. This is a story of the truth of the scripture. Uh, that's why it says in verse 25, whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. If the truth is ignored, it grows dim, and darkness will fill the vacuum. And other lights will take its place. The light of reason or intellect or science or whatever it might be. And so Jesus is declaring here in Mark chapter 4 that the truth has been unveiled. Let the light be the center. The truth be the center. of. Let him be the center of your life. And it goes on here in, in, in Mark chapter 4 and it says, The kingdom of God is a man as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night, rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow himself. He does not know how it does this. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that full grain. But then when it ripens, he puts the sickle because the harvest has come. He's got this, this story of, of, of light that should be in the center. And I want you to remember that all of these sayings that he's, he's speaking of here have to do with the kingdom of God, its rule, its authority, its impact. Last week's parable was about a sower and a seed. And it, most of the emphasis was on the soil, the dirt. But this section, this parable, the focus is, is on the seed, not the dirt. The dirt was all about the condition of the heart. This is about the mystery of the seed and how it produces a crop, how it produces a harvest. In, in verse 26 there, he's describing the kingdom of God, how it grows and how it bears fruit. We don't understand how that works. It, it's a mystery. We can share it. We can scatter the seed, the gospel, so to speak. We, we can shine the light. But how it grows, how it produces the fruit of life is, is God's thing. It's his thing. We cannot force or produce a harvest. It's like the, the, the sower goes out there. And he throws the seed in. He's thinking, man, uh, I hope I have a harvest. But the final outcome is with the Lord. His timing, his season, some seed sprouts quickly, others it takes a long, long time. Some of you might have heard the gospel the first time and, Lord, I, I, I need Jesus. Some of you, well, you, you just, it took you forever. Some of you might still be sitting there. And the seed is, is trying to, 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 to take root. It's trying to grow. Uh, God, God has called us to scatter the seed and to nourish the plant and reap the harvest. But he's the one that causes the results, right? He's the one that makes it happen. I'll, I'll never forget. I had a, a guy I, I ran into recently. and he, he built a house for me many, many years ago. In Tiger Point, he, he didn't come to the church, but I knew him, and we were building this house, and, and uh, we were talking one day, and I said, yeah, we have a believer's baptism this weekend. He goes, oh, what's a believer's baptism? And he was a, 
Nothing against Presbyterians, but he was a, a deacon in a Presbyterian church. I said, you don't know what a believer's baptism is? He said, no, I was sprinkled when I was a child. I, I'd be interested in knowing what that means. I go, well, we should talk about that. So we're in the midst of building this house, and I'd see him, he'd see me, and one day he came by my office, and he sat there, and he goes, I'm ready to hear about believer's baptism. I go, well, tell me about your baptism. He goes, well, I don't remember it. I was just a child. But I was baptized. I go, okay. I said, well, believer's baptism, what I, the way I would describe it is you know for sure that you're going to heaven, and so you follow the Lord in baptism, and it's symbolic of you dying to your old life and rising to a new life in Jesus Christ. He goes, well, what, what, is, what are you talking about? And so I shared the gospel with him, and he got saved. And, and he, he's got, he said, I've never heard this. I go, you're a deacon in a church? He goes, I've never heard this before. How, you know how you open the door, let Jesus Christ come into your life. He started attending the church. And after COVID and the bridge being closed and da-da-da-da-da, he, 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 he's going to another church over in Pensacola. And so I, I ran into him recently and it's been a while since I've seen him. We hugged and I said, hey, thank you so much for all you did for Lynn and I. He goes, oh, no, thank you for what you did for me. I said, I didn't do nothing. I just scattered a seed. And that's what we do. I, I had no idea the seed was going to come to fruition that day in my office. <laughs> The, the, the seed started off with just saying, believer's baptism. And it struck his heart, it struck his mind. It's amazing what the Lord will do if you and I will scatter the seed. If we'll keep the light in the center. If we'll follow the truth and not get sucked into the darkness. Listen to what this, this passage says. The kingdom of God is if a man should scatter seed on the ground, sleep by night and rise by day, and, and it will sprout. He, he doesn't know how it grows, but the earth yields crops and does it by the blade, the head, and the full grain. And then comes the ripening and the harvest. And, and so what shall we liken the kingdom of God, verse 30, or, or, or with what parable shall we picture? It's like a mustard seed, which when it's sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. But when it's sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. There's this kingdom of God parable that he's telling all through this. And here we have that small becomes great. Jesus gives us a parable about a mustard seed. It's really not the smallest of all seeds, but probably the smallest of all seeds to the listeners. And I've got a little picture of a mustard seed and how small it is and what it could grow into. So you could have a seed that small to grow into a tree 10 to 20 feet tall. And so Jesus is comparing the kingdom of God, his truth, how it has come and how it will grow and how it will expand. It's amazing. I mean, think about Jesus. Most of his ministry there around Capernaum, except back and forth to Jerusalem for feasts and festivals, little nation of Israel. And now that little scattered seed of the gospel, that, that light that was placed in the center of the room by those disciples and those apostles and those 3,000 that were come to life on the day of Pentecost, has reached the entire world. Why, it's even in Papua New Guinea with Kevin Lynn of all people. It's in Istanbul, Turkey. It's in Maui. I, I, I would think it would make it to Maui. But it's reached around the entire, it's in Gulf Breeze, Florida. If you've ever been to Israel and see how small it is, you can travel all over the country in a day. It, 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 it's, this little seed of the gospel has reached the entire world. One third of the world's population declares itself Christian. There's 2.3 to 2.5 billion Christians in the world. Started out with Jesus and 12 unlearned men. 
a little bitty mustard seed. 37 million churches across the world. It speaks of birds nesting in it, and many believe that would be Gentiles like you and I who, who found shade and sustenance in the gospel. Very small, the mustard seed. Very insignificant. It's not what you would pick, is what Jesus is saying here, to start a kingdom. But it's what God would pick. God chose the weak, he chose the small, so it'd be obvious whose kingdom it is. It's not my kingdom, not your kingdom. It's God's kingdom. And he scatters the seed, and he calls you and I to be a part of that. He calls us to keep the truth of the gospel and Jesus Christ in the center of all that we do, not only for our own benefit to be able to walk in the midst of darkness, but that the kingdom of God would no longer be mysterious or hidden because, listen, the light has come. It's here. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's the truth. He's the way. He's the life. He's the truth of salvation and the true way to live life. It's an amazing thing. And I would encourage you, if you're walking in darkness or if you're playing the game of Christianity, that you should come into the light. Not, not because God is not wanting you to have pleasure or fun, but because he knows what's best for you. He wants you to be able to see clearly and, and receive clearly. We, we've been called to put him in the center of our life and to spread the truth of the kingdom and trust him to bring forth the harvest. It can start small with just a prayer. You, you can pray for someone, and that's one way to scatter the seed. You can invite someone to church. You can just be friendly in your neighborhood. I know that's, that's going way out there. <laughs> just say hi once in a while. And say, Lord, if you'll open the door, I'll walk through it. You know, I've got neighbors around me who aren't Christians, and I pray for them. One day I heard one was in the hospital. His wife kind of reached out and said, yeah, my son, my husband, we don't know what's going on. So I just went by and visited him. I said, you think he'd be okay if I went in? So I brought that little doctor with me. We, no, I didn't take him. <laughs> and I just prayed for him. And ever since then, we've got a little relationship going on. He's invited me into some of his difficulties. We have the opportunity to share, to pray, to spread the truth of the kingdom of God. And one day Jesus is coming, or, or if he doesn't come, your body's going to wear out. And you're going home. And you'll stand before the truth, the way, and the life. And, and, and you'll find out. Uh, you know, th th there's a guy who, who wrote a story about a frontier town and a little boy, a guy was on a horse, this little kid was in a wagon, and the horse bolted when he was in the wagon. And a young man risked his life to catch the horse and stop the wagon. And the child was saved. But he grew up in this western town of many years ago, and he became a lawless person. And one day he stood before a judge to be sentenced for a very serious crime. And this young boy who had now grown up, he recognized the judge as the man who years before had saved his life. So he pled for mercy on the basis of their experience together. But, but the words from the bench silenced his voice because he said, young man, then I was your savior, but today I'm your judge. And I must sentence you to be hanged. And, and one day, Jesus will say to rebellious sinners during that long time of grace right now, where the light is obvious and it's shining and the kingdom of God has come, one day he say, I wanted to be your savior, and I would have forgiven you. But today I'm your judge. And scripture says that day will come where he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. And that's the, that's the truth of the scripture. You can ignore it. You can deny it. 
You can use reason and intellect and, and, and culture and all tolerance and all these different things and say, well, I don't choose to believe that. And, and that's what was going on when the kingdom of God had come. And the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees all tried to say he's not the one. They tried to darken the light the best they could. And so Jesus says in our passage today, the lamp is not brought to be put under a basket or a bushel or, 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 or under a bed. It's to be set in the center of all things and to give light and life to those who have ears to hear. Right? And what a wonderful thing is when God allows you to open your ears and hear the truth. You know, I, I, I've, I've lived longer than, than, actually, than I want. I don't want to be this old. It's not my fault. <laughs> but growing up in this community, living here most of my whole life, I've had the painful honor of doing all kinds of funerals for friends I grew up with who didn't come to the light. And the lifestyles that they lived would have been the same lifestyle I would have lived. I would have been like Tim LaCroix. <laughs> but, but God has a way of reaching in and saying, I'm the light. Will you embrace the truth? And at the age of 18, I said, hey, if you can change me, I'll embrace the truth. And what a wonderful path it's been. And I can relate to the passage Mark read earlier where he said, I'm the chief of sinners. But God sends his light. He plants his seed. And he brings it to harvest, and then he gives us the wonderful privilege of being part of that harvest together.